What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am joined today by nine-time Academy Award winning, eight Academy Awards straight up, and one special Technical Academy Award, Dennis Murin, the great Dennis Murin. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dennis. How are you? Sure. Just fine. All right, good. This is a this is a very nice setup you have here. Is this um is this in your house? Is it looks very spacious, very comfortable. Yeah, well, you're mostly seeing the outdoors. Yeah, it's our house, our other part of our house. Someone's doing a little bit of work there for a half hour or so. So I, it's going to be noisy. All right, awesome. So. Well, yeah, noisy, noisy, noisy or not, any chance to get a, a you know to to chat with you is is something very special. So I um. I wanted to pick your brain today about a few things. Um, obviously, you know, the 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 ape in the room here is that I'm using an avatar now, you know, versus when we last spoke that I was just a mere uh, mortal. What what What's some of your take being the guy who pretty much gave us all these toys, you know, philosophically at least, what's your take with this whole kind of metaverse concept that I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about and people trying to, relate to their avatars maybe more than themselves how does all that kind of touch you or not you know it's i'm not being you know i don't relate to it the way you and probably a lot of other people and probably people more than us combined do you know i guess it's all right i i just don't know i you know i'm more of just actually being with somebody and just looking at them and seeing them and understanding who they are and talking to them and stuff like that I wouldn't judge anybody though by this. I mean, I don't feel oh. it. You know, I you, you, we kind of are what we grow up with. You know, sure. so you and know, there is there's something about having an expression beyond this that's kind of interesting and fun, uh, but it's also you know something you can hide behind, which maybe is good, maybe bad, or a hundred times more expressive. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny because right now, this is what I call V1 of my sort of avatar experiment. And currently, I actually have a team of engineers working on a full uh, body tracking solution with a lot more facial expressions than this has. Because this is pretty good. It's, it has eyes and mouth and, and stuff like that. But like to really get in there and like really start evolving the, the expressiveness that you can sort of puppeteer with with the avatar in real time right because that's the distinction um is pretty exciting if somebody like you this is the kind of task that you grew up kind of solving right like like some george lucas would walk into a room and say hey i want to only do zoom meetings as an avatar then you have to go out with your team and like solve this kind of stuff right it, 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 it's it's a similar type of situation isn't it I think, you know, I somewhat I'd say so. You except you're asking for, you know, a couple of steps ahead. And <laughs> George would be asking for something that's, you know, five miles ahead and around the corner and <laughs> quarter miles underground. Um, oh man, that's such a I cool analogy. A lot of little leaps. I and mean, right now I'm looking at what you've got there. That background totally reminds me of the first, you know, the, the Phantom Menace. We really started getting air the high rise buildings, and you mix that with some stuff maybe back in Blade Runner with the color. And, and the mist or you know where's that from i i see a lot of stuff that i worked on or didn't work or was influenced like in the work i'm seeing now i would love to be blown away by some of the stuff the avatar stuff i'm seeing and it really hasn't happened yet you know and i think i, I don't know how it's going to happen maybe you guys will get there when and i don't know what does blown away mean you know i see you perfectly but actually it's not you but it looks like it's perfect. That would be pretty freaky if you see something where there's no clue that it's not the person I'm talking to. That That'd that's the goal. Neat. That yeah, would be yeah, pretty yeah. neat. That'd be pretty neat. Yeah. There's there's actually a project. I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's a project uh, by the company Unreal called the. Yeah. Oh, I know Unreal. Yeah. We used, yeah, yeah. We used Unreal back on Hulk in the early eight two uh, thousands to do a little bit of previs on the set live during uh, during Hulk. So they're oh, great. Tell me a little yeah. bit about that. Tell me. Yeah, because like now it's the industry standard. Now, you you know, every episode of The Mandalorian, as I'm sure you know, and, and right, every right, movie right. and, you know, Jurassic Park and um, and all that stuff completely uses that tech. But you guys kind of brought that into the Hulk? Well, I, yeah, I was trying to find some way to help the crew, the live action crew, which really hadn't done many effects films before, you know, Ang Lee and, 
and you know the camera guys and, and the art directors, anybody who wanted to see it, some way to visualize what it might the scene might look like with Hulk in it. Mm -hmm. Knowing it, it didn't have to be photo real. I mean, neither did it on a laptop. So I because we were doing a lot of location shooting. So and it had to work. Nothing could be wrong with it. So the and the, Wilson Tang at the time was working on ILM and he was a big fan of Unreal. And uh, he and there's a lot of other stuff going on at ILM, but he said this is the thing to really look at if you want something like that. It's fast, you know. It uh, it's dependable. They're just they're it's just great being a gaming engine, which is exactly what I was looking for. The renders don't have to look great; they just have to be there. And you can line up angles, you can put characters into it. So what we sort of came up with was uh, taking a point of view from the camera. We had a video camera set up. I think we did it in the video, or maybe we did it on the video tap actually coming out of the camera huh. and overlaid a shape we, we had the distance from the camera to the actor the angle we were shooting the lens we were shooting and we added on to that what a 12 foot tall hulk would look like from a certain distance and it was i thought it was really neat it didn't you know you could really find the composition you could move the cameras around a little bit and everything nobody cared <laughs> <laughs> so I, I enjoyed it the two days I had out there and could show it. But you know, they're, they're used to that whole group, including me, even are used to visualizing this in our minds. You know, we don't really need to see this because later on, if it, you know, I, later on, ILM will fix it. We'll make it. If it's not quite right, ILM will make it look right. But I wanted I mean, to have, I wanted to take another step. I've always been interested in the value of any technology to make the filmmaking process faster and better and the final result better. So one one thousand percent. Then we did, we did stuff in AI actually before that, that was much more complicated, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't anything that we could really take out in location like we could with that. And then when, when you guys were working, uh, because look, I mean, this is like what I want my listeners to understand is that you are literally the dude that we, you no, know, no, no, well, well, you're a member of a team. You're a member of a team, a, a leader of a team who gave us all of these little toys that we have now to do all this real time rendering stuff. Philosophically, it all kind of stems from, you know, uh, inflection points in your work. I mean, even going back to the abyss, um, the abyss with the quote unquote first fully kind of realized 3d rendered character with the i'm not sure what you guys called it but the uh you know like the water creature um when yeah. you guys were doing that rendering were you using proprietary technology or were you using a third party like uh like a maya or like back then i'm not lightweight yeah the animation i think the animation done was with si uh soft homage uh well, or soft alias, homage, right. an alias wavefront might have been i you know i can't remember exactly all was changing so quickly. We use RenderMan for the renderings that that we had developed. Pixar had de ILM developed when Pixar was there with those guys, and then when they left, we kept all the technology and still have a relationship with them. So wow. you know, we had the we had the tools to be able to do stuff with it. What 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 I was was instrumental at and really pushing was that I'm just impatient. I'm an impatient person, <laughs> but I've got to. But we've got to deliver something on time. You mm. can't screw up. And it's got to be on budget. And on time pretty much means, you know, next in these days, I've met, it's going to be done in April because the movie's coming out in June, you know. Sure. And that was it. So, you know, as long as anything can fit in that in constraints and I, I kind of have a backup plan, I'm willing to take the risk to do it. And, uh, you know, I... I, the, I, had, I was in the, I had the authority being the supervisor on the show to do it. There were a few people, like I mentioned, Wilson and other folks around that wanted to do this, but they needed, you know, they, you need somebody in there to be a champion for everybody and then to bring it kind of together. And then the great thing about ILM then, in any place actually, that, that these guys, you know, where we've got deadlines is as opposed to, you know, somebody working at home on it or you're, you're at a university working on a research project, these deadlines, are great because they force everybody to go into sort of like hyperspeed and hyper power and hyper thinking, you know, to get the show done. And not only that, you've got an audience for it. So it comes out and you can see how it worked. And then yeah. you can go on to the next show and the thing, and you've got an audience. It's not, you're not judging yourself. You're, you know, you let the people decide 
Was this good? Was that bad? You know, stuff like that. It's it's just amazing. That's one of the biggest advantages that we have in the film industry. And it's going on right now everywhere where the work isn't private. And all, you know, since films and CG really took over, but in films, all you know, putting these things out with a deadline means you are just constantly learning. And, you you know, which is, I think, is just really important if you want to keep moving ahead, you know, and you're, you're trying to satisfy the audience. If you're an artist, you can work on your own. You can work as long as you want, you know, on one project. That's fine. But if you if you are uh, like I try to do different things all the time, you know, and mm-hmm. and, you know, keep audiences entertained. It's great. You know, what, one thing that I can use, because currently I'm involved in making um, a really big VR project. Um, and it's a multiplayer game and it's, you know, it's, it's extremely complicated and through my years, you know, because, you know, I've worked on many video games and many productions through my years, I've always had to kind of balance how much you can ask of a team before you start burning them out. And, you know, deadlines obviously are like, you know, give us crunch time, like, sorry guys, but you know, we gotta, we gotta hit this milestone you know, you work here, your responsibility is to like finish the job. How did you again and again and again and again and again manage that kind of time pressure with your staff? Like, like, you know, on some like guru leadership thing, like what, what's that balance that you strike when you know that you're asking a little too much of your staff? Well, you know, there's a lot of answers there. Um, the staff often doesn't know if they're in trouble. <laughs> you know, they're, they're going on faith because everybody's pretty much working on part of a project. Sure. You know, it's up to me or whoever's the supervisor of it to see the overall thing and to be able to see where every part of that is, where everybody working on it is, you know, as far as creating it, being able to do it. And mentally, are they, are they, are they overworked? You know, are they going to hurt themselves because they're going to try, are they trying to do the impossible? Are we asking too much of them? Mm-hmm. The nice thing about the ILM being is, you know, around for what, 40 or 50 years or whatever it's been. We started in the crunch with Star Wars. You know, mm-hmm. we all we were all in our early our 30s, early 30s or they came together, you know, with a lot of energy. And, you know, after that, from one show to another show, you know, again, year after year, one project, a year later, another project, a year later, another project going on for all. And then eventually you got multiple supervisors in, multiple projects. You learned very well what, you know, that the deadline's real. The people have got to be able to do their job. They want advancement, to give them an opportunity. You know, if somebody is, is struggling with it, it doesn't mean they're doing anything wrong. They were maybe in the wrong position in the first place. They'll be better over here doing this mm-hmm. because that's what we really need right now. It's right. Somebody else to do the other. So there's a lot of switching around going on in there too. Interesting. So uh, I think that's kind of what it is. It's like experience. I, it, but somebody's got to keep it viewed from a distance. And ILM, we've got a lot of people that are doing that, not just the supervisor. Now we have a lot. We used to just not have too many, but you know, we're interviewing the, the, the people are looking at the crew, talking to them all the time. How you doing? You want more donuts? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, sure. something better than donuts. Uh, you know, keep keep people's stamina going. Try not to overwork, and keep everybody's enthusiasm also by looking at the work. And uh, you know, if you can do it, turn out work that nobody's seen before, so they're as excited as as why they got into the business in the first place. Why I got into the business, you know, to do something nobody else had done. Yeah, and. and- when, when I was working over at Rockstar Games many, many, many years ago, um, the fact that the games were so successful was also a huge motivating factor in putting in that crunch. And it was easier to ask a lot of the staff because everybody knew that the track record was so high. So I guess that helps, right? If you know, you can't keep Absolutely. crunching people into constant failures, right? I mean, you know. Right, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, you know, you want to know you're working on something people are going to like and that you like. You know, we all have projects that didn't go over, but we may be very happy with the work. But that wears out after a while when when you want, you know, 80 million people to see what you've done or something, you know. And that's why you're kind of there too. 
in, in all your time as a supervisor, like I have all these little quotes that I run around in my head when I when I run into some trouble. Like, you know, one of my favorite ones was from Steve Jobs that, you know, the job, you know, the job of a CEO is to recruit talent. You know, like that's the number one responsibility. If you're not ready to take that on, then you shouldn't be a CEO. Um, what was that? What are some of those little nuggets that that you've gotten over your years as a as a leader, as a boss that like have held true as these little axioms of 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 good management? Yeah, you know, one of them was from Bill Lear, who created the Lear Jet. Oh, interesting. And the jet plane. He he said the success of a company is when it can go on successfully without you. Mm. And I've always thought not that it's my company, and it certainly isn't, ILM, but the people have got to get better and better and better. And at some point, I'm going to want to get out, which I've done uh, eventually, want to. And But the, what the, we want them to continue. You know, that's the sign that something really good has happened. People haven't just been sort of kept in their place. So all the people who've shown something and be able to follow through and move ahead, work with people, you know, all that sort of stuff, and having left, some people want to leave, and that's fine too. But, you know, you want to be able to have people like that. That that can, the, that can sustain the company after you, and then dozens like ILM, hundreds of people have left over the years, probably thousands, and thousands of more have come in. Yeah, and yeah, you're still, still yeah, crazy. yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, no, it is crazy. And um, is that like a? Um, is it about making sure that there's enough growth happening within the staff and like? almost being a stickler to make sure that nobody's staying at the same position too long. Like how do you from, from the high level, make sure that that knowledge is getting evenly distributed and growing amongst the staff that are maybe not like principals or owners or, mm -hmm. you know. Well, from the very beginning, our dailies, for example, have always been open. Anybody who wants to come in and watch our dailies, they can see them. That's not true of other companies. Some That's do, interesting. but some don't want that. So transparency you know, is one thing. Well, and, and and the reason is in the long term, which actually means just on the show you're working on, they're learning something about another shot that they weren't working on, but maybe that technique will work for me on this shot because, you know, it's all the same show and we have to make this dragon or whatever it is. You know, I didn't know he was working on it. He solved that problem already. So you have open dailies, and from that, they grow. And all the people working on it are learning. Some people don't want to move up. You know, they do for a while, and they're very happy, and they want to settle there, and they just love doing, you know, the precision of what of the task is for them and do it, do it, you know, as good as anybody can do it. And other people are really interested in moving, and, and uh, you know, we just, you, there's, there's not enough room for everybody to advance all the time. Sure. So, you know, you just, you, you, there's no way that it's perfect. And any time in any sort of situation, you can kind of look at it politically and say, you know, boy, they fouled up here. You know, they didn't have enough work at that period of time to keep that part of the crew. But it's not your, it's not our fault necessarily. You know, we're, we're ultimately, if the, if the studios are not paying us to do the work and they don't have the projects for us, then we're out of work. You know, George yeah. isn't going to keep doing it and Stephen isn't going to keep doing it. And, you know, who's going to keep supplying it? So we, we're we incredibly fortunate that Star Wars was not a one-off, which is what all us old timers thought when we were doing it. Right. You know, it won't happen again. We'll be, you know, hey, goodbye. We had a great year. Goodbye. And then, you know, Close Encounters and then, you know, Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. I remember before that, even then, but, you know, for Empire, and then it just went on and on, and then games came in, right? right. And computers, and you didn't have to go anywhere to learn your job. You could learn it in your, in your bedroom, you know, which was an incredible thing to happen. And now it's just, it's commonplace. So you guys are all, I don't know about you, how quite how old you are. You look extremely young. Yeah, but, no, I'm I'm in my so mid-40s. You, I'm in my mid-40s, yeah, so I'm like you Gen like X. You're about about 18 or 16 or something <laughs> right. like that. But, you know, to start off with being able to have access to the tools to make images that are in your mind, I, you know, I can't imagine what you're going to do with that when you had sure. another 10 or 20 years to think about it. You know, it's just fabulous. 
uh, compared to the what we had to go through where, you know, you could hardly do anything in your own house. You had to go to a factory, you know, movie studio, and you had to have mills and saws and, yeah. you know, lights and cameras, electricity, actors, all that sort of stuff. You don't need them anymore. It, and that's such an important point that I think is is something that I struggle with, which is so many times, you know, you just said it a little bit ago, to do things that have never been done before is, is the entire draw, it seems like, in your career. Because if you look up and down your your the, the pictures that you worked on, almost every single one has an achievement a technical achievement that pushed the entire industry forward. And nowadays, people, maybe it's a, it's a downside of having all of these tools available to you that everybody kind of feels, well, everything has been done and I know what's possible and not possible. Um, how, how do you train a team to have the mindset that no is not a real answer, that it's just a matter of how? like how we do it, like how we innovate, how we like, you know, innovate to actually make it happen. Well, you know, I semi-retired pretty much did it four or five or six years ago. I don't know how long it's been and I really am, am retired now. It's sure. a different world and I can answer it for back then. And that is, we all kind of find each other, you know, mm -hmm. because people aren't walking around with a light bulb over their head or a, you know, an avatar face saying, promote me, promote me, or I'm smart. I'm smart. <laughs> right. So you got to find from within, from within, I talk to people who are the ones that have got ideas that, in my opinion, are new, not just ideas that are being recycled. There are so many ideas that are being recycled in every profession, you know, that somebody grows up loving, you know, a, a character with a big giant teeth and the eyebrows are right. going up, creature face or something. And they'll be drawing drawings of, they say it when they're 10 years old, 15 years old, 20, 30 years later, they'll still be doing artwork of that same thing. That's fine, but it's not necessarily progressive. I mean, they're really refining it. They're into it very tightly and they're seeing these incredible little minutiae differences that other fans like them will recognize. But for the in, for an industry, for a film industry where you can't see that minutia yet, maybe you will someday, uh, you need bigger change than that. You need something that the, the mass population that goes used to go or still does go to a movie once every week or two, you know, that they will recognize. You know, it's almost like the performance that goes into a close-up of an actor's face that's so subtle over a film that isn't yet into a monster face, for example, where a, a character or right. whatever it is, a synthetic character, you know, it's kind of, you know, Jim Cameron's kind of getting there in Avatar, it's happening here and there. It's happening here and there. But people have got to come up to that and get used to sort of recognizing these funny faces and getting used to them for a two-hour movie. Yeah. So that they can act with the complexity of a human. Yeah. And uh, spoiler warning for The Mandalorian. So oh, I'm sorry, not The Mandalorian, The Book of Boba Fett. Spoiler warning. Um, the one technology that I was very involved with in its inception was a deep fake technology. I did a bunch of deep fake videos that, you know, won me awards and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. were viral and all that stuff. One of them, actually my my main piece was a George Lucas, um, you know, impersonation that uh, a very talented actor named Josh, uh, you know, Robert, uh, you know, Thompson uh, does. And now the deep fake technology has actually kind of infiltrated its way into the Boba Fett show I don't know. Did you watch um, the latest episode of the Boba Fett show? No, sorry, I haven't. I haven't. Okay, okay. You know what? That I won't bring it up because I don't want to spoil <laughs> it for you. Um, but you know, in no, any it, case, it still has, the thing is, it still has a ways to go. Looking at it on a video screen, looking at it on a, you know, on a two K or four K video screen, is not the same as if you go into a theater and look at a big. Now at home on your TV, oh, that's maybe a good point. It's that's a good there, point, but man. That subtlety that, that you can be fooled by thinking some of those deep fakes are phenomenal and probably some of the ones you did. You know, is that the, I don't know if that's the panel discussion when you were talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one's mine. You know, you look at it and oh, my God, this is the most amazing thing. But I think <laughs> Thank you very much. Movie, put it into a movie with live actors around it. I tell you, anybody will be able to see it.
They won't know sure. what it is. And that last bit, it just gets harder and harder and harder. That's closer you get to getting it. It's yeah. still hard. <laughs> oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. Yeah. And like in this uh, latest episode of Boba Fett, there's a very famous character, you know, um, you know, it's Luke Skywalker. I'm just going to say it. it's Luke Skywalker, but it's a very young Mark Hamill. Um, and, you know, I'm watching it on 4K in my projector at home. To your point, maybe on a bigger screen, it would be even more amplified. But it's looking pretty damn good. But even then, like, you still feel like, oh, is this a video game character? Like, you know, there's something there, there's something off about the performance, about the angles that are chosen, you know. But the point is, is that you got to give them credit, you know, for trying. And, like, that to me is the beauty of it, right? Like, at least are you trying to advance it forward, you know? And, like, that's always been, like, when I look at your career, and it's just such an amazing career, it seems like the amount of um, room to fail that you guys gave yourself must be so empowering because nine out of ten times it was a huge success, you know? And, like, that risk that you took outside of the safety zone is the reason why we have such, you know, forward motion in the special effects world. Um, well, and, it's and also, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I'm just going to say at the time, this stuff hadn't been done before. Right. And one of the problems that's going, if you want to call it a problem, and I don't know if it necessarily is, but to me it kind of is, is you can do like practically anything. So you bring up the idea of, you know, I want to see, you know, 800 flying uh, demons you know, flying through the, the streets of Toronto, you know, doing phenomenal things I've never seen, tearing through buildings. And, right. you know, there's been flying behind them and wings and everything like that, whatever, whatever you're thinking of. Or young people that are, we actually have the actor, but we need to see him 40 years earlier. Or the other, Well, you know, that stuff is the tools are kind of in place for, some, for a lot of that. And the tools are there that could do phenomenal jobs on most of things. I don't think they're quite there on the deep fake or however they end up solving this or not, but they will be. Eventually something like that's going to come. So where do you need the original thinking if the tools are already there and everybody's kind of already done it to some extent? What you're doing is a better version of this, hopefully, or a bigger version of that or a brighter version or a scarier version. But, but the, it's in front of the cameras, kind of the same stuff you've seen in one of the, you know, 5,000 amazing effects films that have come out in the last, you know, in the last 20 or 30 years. But in, as I was growing up, those mm -hmm. films, those ideas had never even been on the screen before. Sure. And we had to come up with a way to make those with the tool sets we had. But it means nobody had even thought about what it would look like to see it, you know? And they, there was nothing, you, you could never put it against anything. You could never judge it against anything. You know, when we did the first Jurassic Park, I thought after seeing at the dinosaurs, when we were done at that, I said, these are going to look obsolete in five years. Because I, <laughs> I know a lot of the stuff that doesn't work about it. Their skin isn't right on the bodies. It's, I just know, if you look at real animals, they aren't quite right, but they look great. You know, you love them anyway. Oh, God, they still look but I figured, you know, we're going to top ourselves in five years. And I worked on the sequel to it. And we couldn't do it. Yeah, you and couldn't do it. That, <laughs> other people have tried and tried. But I don't, I'm not saying that, that they're right. I'm saying that, that this has to come with deep thinking. Right. And deep right. study of nature. And just deep analysis. And then to, uh, revisions on the tool set to do them and all like that. And there really isn't much time to do that in movies anymore. And I don't think it's being asked as much as it used to, to be done, because the tools can do something that can tell the story and they can have phenomenal stories. So yeah. anyway. No, no. When, when I was at NYU, it, 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 it reminds me of one of the best articles that I ever read when I was at school and it has stuck with me to this day. And it was a, a magazine back in the day called Sight and Sound Magazine. I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with this magazine. Oh, yeah. And, and, and Sight and Sound magazine, one one random article had a had a a interview with uh, Stanley Kubrick um, about special effects, and he was talking a little bit about AI uh, back when he was still kind of ideating AI in the early days, and he he was in this article he's obsessed with this concept 
of that there's no way to make a fake rock that like no prop shop in the world could make a fake rock because the rock is always going to be a rock and the fake rock is always going to look like a fake rock and and that there's like you know no no you know connective tissue between these two things and actually um i kind of forget like the deeper point of the article but that concept of the rock thing has always kind of stuck with me and i know that you did you just random thought did you actually work on those early tests of ai uh post spielberg traveling over to to england to to visit with stanley about ai because after he saw jurassic park his entire world uh changed in his mind about what what was going to be possible in filmmaking well, yeah, supposedly yeah. yeah i went over to see stanley after just after that and took the it took oh you the, went to see stanley yeah yeah i'm the one that went over there Steve, oh, wow. Steve and Stanley have talked all the time over the telephone, and I'm sure they knew each other personally also. But I got a call from him. Can you come on over here? I've got this movie I want to do. And I and because I saw Jurassic Park, maybe it can be done. He didn't know if it could be done. He just knew there has been a technological leap, you know. And with computers, you can maybe do anything. And, yeah, and, you know, we worked on it for probably, I guess, maybe four months, six months, something like that, trying to make the David character i think that was his name the kid uh, -huh. uh as, as a three-dimensional character it didn't he stanley didn't care but it right. had to look on the screen gotcha. like, like like a kid but there's something unsettling mm. and that's what he could never figure out you know what is unsettling and uh and when you think about it then you then you're getting into a Stanley Kubrick movie because the kid doesn't know there's anything wrong with him, right? Right. And right. yet you look at him, and you know, I had some ideas. We never shot him. I thought one where he could be absolutely perfectly still if he's in a conversation with somebody, and only the lower part of his face is moving. And when he's listening, he's not moving at all. But when he does, you know, it's kind of a robotic look or something. Oh, I like that. I like but, that. Well, <laughs> I, you know, that sounds. I, I didn't know this at the time. I don't know if you know who Chris Cunningham is, a terrific director. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he directed Home Alone, I believe. No, no, no. This no. is Chris Cunningham. He's an English okay. effects guy. He did a lot of commercials. Brilliant, way out there sort of stuff. Uh, and most of them haven't come to the States, but there have been some. But he was, he is. He's the guy still alive, I think. But you really saw technology and could imagine his mind really creepy things to look at. Well, Stanley had him working on a bust of the kid's head and for a year and never nothing ever came of that either. So I could never get Stanley to come up to even shoot any tests or anything for what I was trying. And Chris couldn't come up with anything that, that gave him the confidence that he could make the movie. Uh, and I don't know what eventually turned his mind off, but he was saying to Stephen, you should make this movie. I mean, it's your movie. It's too emotional. I'm, I'm, I'm approaching this in an unemotional way, and that's well, that's, I, that's the way I'd like to make it. But you, if you made an emotional movie, it's still a good story. So you're saying because this is unknown, I think to the yeah, public. I talked, I talked about that, it a lot. But. Oh, okay, okay. That that Chris yeah. Cunningham was actually somebody that 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 Stanley was potentially tapping to actually direct AI? Well, no, no, just, no, no. Chris is also a sculptor. A sculptor, oh, an artist, model maker, all sorts of stuff like that. He, he asked Chris to either make or put a little crew together. I, don't know, I think Chris, he might have done it himself. I don't know. To show me an example of what the head could look like. Interesting. So how the head's going to move, you know, the, the, you've got to get that face right. So it's got to look like a kid, but it's got to be kind of creepy, right? And yeah. it, isn't, it doesn't want to look like it's just a, you know, an internal robotic thing with gears and wires and plungers and cables and all that moving, a, you know, a silicone face. That's not what he wanted at all. Right. So, and but what did he want? He, he could never figure it out. And because Chris, I never saw what Chris did. I never saw what direction he was going into at all. But I thought it was interesting that he had, you know, two different approaches trying because to solve problem and uh and it was uh he needed more people or something i don't know i don't know what because 
Stanley's vision was to have a puppet be the kid throughout the entire movie. He didn't care. No, he had no vision. Oh, he, was oh, talking, he didn't care. He was, talking, he was talking to us about doing, can we do an all CG kit? Maybe. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I, I, I don't think I wouldn't try that first. You know, try, let's try it with a real person and maybe we can augment it. It's the direction I was going with, you know, some little mapping on the face to change things, stuff like that. Stanley really didn't care. I don't think he, I don't think in any of the effects films, there are only a couple of them he did, that he cared about how the effects were done. Yeah. It was, it was, let's look at it and see what works and react to it and try it on the next shot, the next shot. And after 10 of those, yep, this is the way we're going. But, but he didn't come in with a technical point of view. I, all. That's, you know, anyway. I had uh, Dwayne Dunham on the show um, like a month I ago. I saw that. Yeah. 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 I saw it. And, and Dwayne uh, was telling me a story. Um, that Stanley uh, screened, um, I believe it was a David Lynch movie for him and for George. And um, and then on the drive back home, George Lucas tells Dwayne, man, did you notice how much Stanley uses his hands? So, you know, like ever since that, that's what I've been working on for this avatar is to get the hands to animate uh, and track with my hands, you know, because like right now, like if I move, he's just kind of like on a pivot. But like yeah. the hands aren't in there, but the hands are so expressive. Do you also remember that little touch from Stanley? Was he a very speak with his hands type of guy? I only met him one time, and it was for like five hours. Got it. And uh, so it was a long meeting. Uh, and I didn't, you know, he seemed like a nor absolutely normal, nice man, you know, cool. and he was very, very comfortable with, made you comfortable. Um, you know, a little bit overweight, a little bit on the short side, at least to me. So, right. you know, you kind of want to grab him and he's like a nice <laughs> old uncle guy or something like that. Although he was not much older than me. But, you know, I just, I didn't ha come away with any, any outward sign of him being eccentric in any way at all, except that uh, when we started, he had a, a uh, oh, he had a notepad with him and a pen and a whole list of questions on this. And by the time I'd left, five hours later, he had asked me every single question on that. Oh, that's so awesome. he was kind of wanted to pull out of me answers to the questions he had about how to make the movie, how would you do this, how do you do that, and stuff like that. And then after that meeting, you guys worked uh, remotely for about four months. And yeah, just, on just and to, off. Yeah, mostly off. Some, so, so how would you like, like in a world without Dropbox and without email, because back then we, we had very, very rudimentary forms of electronic communication. How would you let him see the progress? Was it like snail mail, like sending pack, like, like sending film reels over there? Yeah. You know, it, we, you know, we didn't have much progress, but there mm -hmm. was a little bit, but what, what he had done from his many conversations he'd had with Steven over the years he had seen what we had done on Jurassic. On that, I said, if we're, there's no way we're going to get Jurassic Park done if Stephen doesn't see these dinosaur dailies immediately. Right. You know, not tomorrow, immediately. So I had the guys look into a way to communicate between our shop and the Tippet shop across the bay, you know, 15 miles, by microwave, you know, two, two oh, of those microwave so cool. things could shoot right to each other. So we had back and forth communication. Oh my God, like walkie talkie on steroids type we stuff. Thought you were looking at a TV screen, you know? And I'd set it up so that we could see their faces, at a, both at a camera, like now with Sky things. But you could see everybody on the screen at the same time. And uh, we had to be real time. There could be no lag. We had to have sound. There were all these things. Oh, we can't have sound and we can't do this. And we got to, you know, it's not fast enough. And come on, guys, it is. And eventually we got it. So when Stephen went away to do Schindler's List, uh, I think it was Schindler's List, right? In Krakow? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Schindler's List is right after that. Jurassic Park, so that makes sense. Yeah. So so he's so here we are. <laughs> We're going to be needing feed when we want. We don't need. I want the feedback from the director, like what he likes and what he doesn't like about it. You know, he's going to run out of time. But he's got to be in there, you know, telling us what's working because, you know, he wants that also. So we set the whole thing up over to Poland. Wow. So here we are in San Francisco and he's in Poland and we're doing the same thing. 
with real-time screens, real-time sound, real-time looking at our faces, so me and Phil Tippett, whoever, we could kind of act out something and comment. <laughs> but there was a connection for those 20 or 30-minute daily sessions. Well, Stanley heard about that and said, oh, my God, maybe I can make the movie now, With even though these guys are in San Francisco and I'm in London. <coughs> um, I'll call up, you know, Dennis and get him over here, and we'll see. So when I went over, I went over and actually brought one of the tapes that we had made of our sessions with Stephen. So he nice. could see how it actually worked. He was all excited about that. You know? that I mean, that's incredible because like, it just seems like your career um, has these hallmarks throughout it of saying, yes, we can, you know? And like that, that that's the kind of thing that like gets me excited. Um, like even in my project now, like it, it's constant. Well, that can't really be done. That can't really be done. And, and it's right. And like having that kind of, engineering partner who who's a little bit better at mathematics and engineering that I am is such a crucial part of my team. Did you have that kind of co-founder partner guy who was like the, you know, like the Einstein of like on the technical side, or is that you, are you the engineer? I, I, I think some of it is me because when I was really young, I was doing stuff like this. You know, I did, I did uh, this movie Equinox, this low budget independent feature when I was like 18 years old with three friends of mine and I. Oh, and wow. I is there I a copy some, of that out there? Yeah, Criterion sells it. Okay, you know, actually, Criterion. I gotta check that out. Yeah, they will look at the original version, not the later, the newer one. I sold it to Jack Harris. He shot some more stuff, but the original is really a, a DIY movie done for six thousand dollars oh, over wow. a period of two years. But it's got some stop motion in it and we needed a background screen and the room to project the frames without burning up the film one thing after another and i came up decided to use front projection which was something that had just come out in england and so i could do it in the only room that i had to do the effects which was 10 feet square and it wasn't big enough to for a projection screen three feet wide so i figured out how to do it you know so I, and I still do this. So I've always done stuff like that. You know, I did a, I did a bunch of a, a science movie that, that was done in the early seventies, two of them uh, for schools, did the mm -hmm. effects on those. And we had a shot where we, you know, there was going to be a shot of the, of the craters on Mars to show how they were whatever, similar to the ones on earth. And I just thought, look, you know, I'm going to shoot this as though it's in, from an airplane. So I did the view looking down on this, the crater we made this out of clay and sand and stuff and sort of dollied the camera around it as though you're in an airplane right so there's some yeah. sort of thinking that i've got in my head that <laughs> i throw in every whatever the problem is i didn't want it to look like it was it was you know god's point of view the static looking on sure. this kind of more believable if they you know if you're in a helicopter you know you're supposed to be on mars you know say you're in a spaceship doing or whatever so I've always wanted to solve the problems. I haven't tried to ignore them. I think the fact that they're a problem is because you thought of something fresh and it just the answer isn't there yet. But the answer probably is there with a little, some changing here and there. I, so. um, I noticed um, that you are actually uh, accredited um, for, in uh, as full motion dinosaurs for Jurassic World uh, Dominion, and I know that you're retired. Um, were you um, involved heavily, or not really, or is that just IMDb just giving you credit because you deserve it? That's IMDb. I don't know. I, I, you know, that was the credit we had. I took for Jurassic. I wanted to come up with something that wasn't just effect supervisor or whatever. And I, you know. Uh, I, we thought full motion dinosaurs because that had never <laughs> right. been done before. That was it. So I don't know what they did, you know. So I, I, I didn't even know I was on there for that. I, I helped out a little bit, so little that I wouldn't even count it on that. So I, I think that's a mistake. Right. Maybe, all, maybe and, all the Jurassic movies are getting mixed up, and my name will end up being in every one of them. You know? Right. Which is maybe not such a bad thing, right? Like, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I'm. I'm actually a big fan of these Jurassic World movies, and I'm I'm pretty pumped about this new one. Uh, but you know nothing about the new one. You didn't really work on it. There's no, there's no. I, you know, 
scuttlebutt. I know people that have worked on it now a little bit here and there. You know, that's sure, all. Sure, sure. Much. Cool, yeah. cool. Is there anything um, like, are you living the fully retired life or is that little guy in the back of your head seeing problems that you want to fix still and like that those creative juices are still flowing? Yeah, that little guy is, just gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. But I'm not in any position to uh, be able to do anything about it. I'll make comments, but it's so it's so different now. You know, I, I wouldn't even know how to go into a project now. You sure. know, with the, the way they're structured with so many hundreds of shots and so many companies working on them, because uh, I need to have my finger everywhere. You know, yeah. <laughs> because I have an idea in my head what it should look like. It starts that kind of that early. And if if I don't have, if I can't get in that early, then I want to be able to latch on to the designs that are already there. And if I like them, then, then move ahead at that point. And make sure the execution is is a way that I think can come back together when it's all done to make something, you know, shockingly amazing or invisibly amazing. Doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, whatever, because like whatever the director wants. We all work for the director. Seeing seeing you right now in, in in my screen and seeing what a big part of your expression your hands are is just making me like obsessed with making sure that I can get that for my avatar, you know? And it's like having somebody like you behind problems just seems to me like it's something that the world needs, you know, that, that kind of yeah. mentality of like, here's an obstacle, you know, and, and, you know, to your earlier point, the end goal is entertainment. You know, the end goal is to have a, a fun time, but how do you facilitate that expression in an invisible way. So anyway, it, it's it's very inspiring for me. Um, but you know, look, we're 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 pushing on fifty minutes, and I want to be very you know careful with your time. Um, one one thing that I do want to ask before I let you go um, earlier in the conversation, you mentioned uh, video games, and obviously, um, Lucas Arts was one of the most influential gaming companies of all time. I mean, like what they did in the video game industry the effects are still being felt to this day. I mean, like almost any any genre of video game you can imagine, sure. you can wow. go back to a LucasArts video game where it all started. Um, hmm. Is video game something that you're still kind of interested in or, or is that something you touch at all or or even look at anymore? I was never interested in them. They were, they were happening in a whole different building or different, not city, but near where we, what we were doing. Uh, I didn't know any of the guys working on them. Sometimes I'd look at stuff, you know, as the rendering was getting better. Yeah. I've never seen a really super early version of a Walker battle. You know, way this has got to have been like 15 or 20 years ago or before that was not real time, but was looking so wonderfully photographic that I just was hoping we could put it in a movie, you know, and, right. uh, and it didn't have to quite look real. But you know, I'm just, I'm I'm not a gamer. I, I did the Monkey Island. I enjoyed doing that. I think oh, that's the best of, one. I, you worked on I that played, a little bit. I played those. Yes. Oh man, I that. that. I but mean, you know, beyond that, it, it's you, you got to be focused. And I'm I sure. uh, I'm too scattered to focus on that. I'm not a I'm not a game player. Sure, sure. No, the Monkey Island was a, a special game because that's one of the first games where it really was very effective in telling a story and making you feel like you're the protagonist in a story and that there was options and different permutations that the story could go. Whether that was real or not is, is irrelevant. The fact is, is that it made you feel like that. And, you know, that that's a monumental moment in game history, that game, you know. The, the I don't know anything about the history, but I think coming from Lucasfilm, you know, and George Lucas, that was no accident. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's there's no chance that a guy like me could look forward to you and George teaming up again and making something. I don't I don't think so. All right. I'm not in this presence. Now maybe sometime as an avatar, both of us. <laughs> right, and right. We won't know if it's even us behind the uh, behind the avatar. Right, right. No, no. It, it's funny because I'm actually working on a little project. I'll tease it here, where I built a really cool George Lucas avatar. And I want to kind of continue my story of the deep fake, evolving it from the deep fake into fully motion captured avatar. And so, you know, keep keep an eye out for that. I'll send it to you once I do it. But 
I've been working on a George avatar, you know. Um, okay, and let me, I'll give you a, a request. If you ever do one of me or going to have somebody do it and it's going to look just like me or whoever. Yeah. It's important, you know, the expressive hands you were talking about. Yep. Well, I sometimes I've got to have like eight fingers on this hand. <laughs> and sometimes this hand, you know, the fingers have got to pop longer and like snap your fingers, but the fingers are two feet long. Or if you say something real funny and I'm listening, then I'll just make oh, and my head will just spin around three times. <laughs> right. so okay, I promise that if I make an avatar of you, I will consult with you to make sure that all these uh, details okay. are in. Now, why the eight fingers? That sounds interesting. Why the eight fingers? I don't know yet. It's just something okay. that I, I have. That's my first thought, which means it's not finished yet. Why but, two hands? Good why point. not eight hands? Why not right. coming from off camera? Yeah, yeah. You know? See, so see, Dennis, is, this is why, this is why I'm still fighting the war, and you've already conquered the hill. You know, well, but and, uh, and, yeah. and I'm too far ahead, which is why there's nobody <laughs> who listen to me. You listen to me. Oh, I listen but to you. Know. Whatever you know, whatever chance I get, um, <laughs> and hopefully you guys are all listening to him. This is the great Dennis Muran. Dennis, thank you so much. This is the second time I've had a chance to chat with you. I felt like we've only been talking for five minutes. It's literally 50 minutes. So it, this is just unbelievable. I'm glad that we got a chance to kind of talk about more contemporary stuff and not just rehashing all your great achievements. And I appreciate uh, your insights, sir. Is there any final words you'd like to, you know, to say? Or? I don't think so. Thanks, Mark, for having me. And I like these conversations that are uh, dealing with, uh, like you said, not the past. Those are important, too. But, you know, what uh, the future is where we're all going to be. It's according to Chriswell, if anybody knows who Chriswell is. Yeah, it's inevitable. From the 50s, you know, time, from the 50s time, movies. <laughs> yeah, time keeps ticking. I've also been having a lot of physicists on the show. I just did one with Brian Keaton. I, I've been trying to mix it up. Um, today, I just released one with Alan Ball, who's a great screenwriter, wrote American Beauty and True Blood. Um, then I, I got Bob Gale, also the creator of, yeah. uh, of Back to the Future. Bob was great. And then mixing it in with physicists and doctors and, and you, the, you know, the legend. So Dennis, thank you once again, sir. Um, and I look forward to doing a third one, if that's cool with you. Okay. We'll see. All right. Cool. We'll Sounds see. great guys. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. right sure. Right. Bye-bye.